Okay, I want to get right into it. Anchor is known for staking, liquid staking. What is this black magic sorcery liquid staking? How does it work? Yeah, so liquid staking was originally uh, created uh, in December 2020 for East liquid staking. And at the time it was really created for preventing liquidity for staked ETH, which were unstakeable and not redeemable. Uh, so since I, I joined Anchor, which was about six months later, um, strategy has been to shift into other chains and where, where staking is actually possible to unstake. What it means for liquid staking is that it creates like a, a liquid asset that represents your staked uh, BNB, Medic, Phantom, Avalanche in the case of uh, Anchor uh, on top of ETH, but you can redeem it. So that's obviously very important for DeFi composability, right? Because you will probably not consider, let's say, Anchor BNB, which is the liquid staking version of BNB, as an alternative to BNB if it's not liquid enough, right? I, I think the redeemability aspect between ETH and uh, we will talk later about the Shanghai upgrade and what it means uh, for liquid staking is very important for the, the capital efficiency of liquid staking. Awesome, sounds pretty cool. DeFi is a bunch of Legos, right? And we know when it gets more sophisticated, when we add more Legos, there's more unpredictability with flash loans and everything. So liquid staking sounds great, but what about the risks associated to it? So there is obviously the, the risk of smart contracts with liquid staking, but I think uh, if uh, some of you are familiar with traditional finance, usually like diversification means like risk reduction, right? And in DeFi, I, I think you need to be careful uh, because you might actually sometimes have different tokens in a pool and actually diversification means increasing risk instead of decreasing risk, right? So smart contract risk is very important and a, a big, uh, let's say, obstacle for institutional uh, providers. So there is, I think, like two ways how to, to handle it. Either institutional investors are concerned about, let's say, the KYC compliance side of it, or they're concerned more about the, the management of the keys of the smart contract and, and the custodial aspect of it. So we really see, after discussions also here in East Dubai, that there is really that uh, common understanding that white label liquid staking is coming and being used by, let's say, big, bigger players that are not necessarily doing liquid staking, but are sticking. If you build too much on top of each other, really there is a then exponential uh, kind of risk effects. How do you think liquid staking compares to traditional staking? Will it gain market shares in a way? And as well, for example, from the project side, traditional staking allows you to have narratives with all the 60% of the supply staked, which you don't really have on liquid staking, right? Because you're reading this. So how do you think the future is gonna evolve for this liquid staking? Remember a few weeks ago, the staking ratio of Ethereum is about, I think it was 40, 14%, and it used to be only 6% a few months ago. But then when you look at other chains, a few months ago, we remember Avalanche had about 65% of all tokens that were uh, staked. So obviously there is a very big correlation about the liquidity risk of, uh, let's say, staking, right? Uh, and the, the, the longer is the unbunding period, the higher is the liquidity risk. So when you have, let's say, trustable liquid staking providers, it reduces the liquidity. Then what about the impact on the APY and the staking ratio? So if there is, let's say, less liquidity risk, the APY requirement for you to basically stake is going to be lower because you have less risk. That aspect is uh, really uh, important. So I think liquid staking actually helps that narrative that uh, like let's say layer one chain wants to have as much as assets possible state to increase the staking ratio. And I think a good example you can track uh, is uh, Polygon. They used to have 27% staking ratio. I think now they're about 39% uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, that was because of the impact of uh, liquid staking coming into uh, the, the Polygon ecosystem. Awesome. How is the liquidity for liquid staking these days? For Ethereum, so far there is no possibility to unstake. So your only option to get liquidity is the second in the market, liquidity. Liquidity pools up are big enough, right? And that has a lot of implications such as using, let's say, you know, STEs uh, from Lido or Rocket Pool on a lending platform such as Aave. You need to have price oracles. For that, you need to have a liquid secondary market, which requires a higher trading volume. For example, on, let's say, Anchor side, it's a bit different because it's unstakeable every seven days. So you don't necessarily need to have, let's say, 70% of all the BNB liquid staking supply on the DEX liquidity pools. Uh, because it's redeemable. So whenever there is a discount on the secondary market, you can uh, 
uh, basically just buy it and stake and you have some uh, trading opportunities So and market makers. So uh, that process is much more efficient. There is a lot of dependency on VEX liquidity pools for ETH liquid staking uh, until the Shanghai upgrade at least. And after the Shanghai upgrade, work for other liquid staking uh, solutions outside Ethereum because liquid staking is elastic in its supply. There is a much less dependency on DEX liquidity. Awesome. Where can people go if they're interested in liquid staking? Sure. So, I mean, on Anchor side, there is a Twitter channel uh, specifically for liquid staking. So, it's Anchor Staking. Um, so we, we do actually uh, four AMAs uh, per month uh, where we talk about like training topics for liquid staking or what it means for the ecosystem. You can find those videos on, on YouTube as well. Yep, that's it for the, the resources on the liquid staking side. Awesome, links will be in the description. Thank you for the